Okay, tell me the difference between the two statements I'm about to make. You ready? Statement one, chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Some of you are going, them are fighting words. Let's go right now. Chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla. Second statement. Look at already we're going at this. Second statement. It's wrong to torture toddlers for fun. All right. What's the difference between those two claims? Somebody help me out. Go ahead. All right. One is subjective, one is objective. All right, I'll go with that. What else? Opinion versus fact. Opinion versus fact. Anybody else? Morality. One's morality, the other is? Preference. Preference. Anybody else want to jump in here? One isn't, hurting something. one isn't hurting something. Okay. Although you might hurt my feelings if you like vanilla instead of chocolate. <laughs> and my feelings matter. No. All right. <laughs> yes, you're all correct. When I talk about chocolate ice cream being better than vanilla, I am telling you something that is true for me, the subject. May not be true for you, but it's true for me. And I'm telling you something that is in the category of personal taste or preferences. When, however, I say it is wrong to torture toddlers for fun, I am no longer talking about what I like or prefer, am I? No. I'm talking about what I believe is right and wrong regardless of one's preferences. And men and women, this is a very, very key distinction to get down. Our culture has reduced moral truth claims to personal preference claims. Uh -huh. And that's why you get people who say things like this. Don't like abortion? Well, don't have one. What's the key word in that bumper sticker? Like. As if the morality of abortion can be reduced to likes and dislikes. Now, this is important for us to determine. There is a difference between a moral claim and a claim about ice cream. Tell me if the claim I'm about to make is a moral claim or a preference claim? Here we go. Writing with a white pen is evil. <laughs> preference or moral? It's moral. I'm claiming it's what to write with the pen? Evil. I prefer writing with a white pen as opposed to a black pen. Preference. Chocolate is better than vanilla. Preference. Killing toddlers for fun is evil. Moral. Now here's the key thing. Everybody listen carefully. Is it possible for a moral claim to be mistaken? Yes. If I say writing with a white pen is evil, I'm making what kind of claim? Moral. But is it a true moral claim? No, it's false. It's false. The color white has no moral significance at all to the writing instrument in my hand. Right? It's possible for a moral claim to be mistaken. You know what the problem is in our culture today? People don't even get to that level. They confuse the two types of claims and try to redefine your claim into a preference one they like better. So, let's look at our pro-life argument that we've come to so far. You can defend your pro-life view in one minute or less. Here it is, and then I'll tell you how people respond. Here it is in one minute or less, and this will be in your notes. We believe elective abortion is wrong because it intentionally kills an innocent human being. The science of embryology establishes that each of us began in the embryonic stage. And philosophically, there's no morally significant difference between the embryo you once were and the adult you are today that would justify killing you at that earlier stage. How long did that take? 45 seconds at the most, a minute at the most. That's written in your notes. You'll have that. Now, instead of responding to that claim with evidence or reasoning to show that the claim is mistaken, what's the typical reply? 
What's the typical reply? You're intolerant. That's just your truth. That's your view. Notice what has just happened. Your claim has not been refuted, men and women. The rules of the game have been changed. Your opponent is not engaging your argument. Your opponent is changing the rules, changing the type of claim you made into one he or she likes better. You see how that's done? So let me give you some examples of this. Several years ago, there was a television show in Los Angeles and actually nationwide in the States. I don't know if you got it up here or not. It was called Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher. Does Bill Maher ring a bell with anybody? He's no friend of conservatives. And political, uh, and by conservatives, I mean moral conservatives, not necessarily progressive conservatives or other types that tend to navigate to the north side of the globe. But anyway, Bill Maher had this show where he would have four people seated, seated around in a panel discussion. It would usually be three uh, liberals against one conservative, which made it about even. And what typically would happen, <laughs> What typically would happen is the three on the left would jump all over the conservative. And it was no exception this one particular night when the representative, so to speak, for the conservative pro-life view was an actress model by the name of Kathy Ireland. I don't know if that name rings a bell, but she was a former supermodel, was once the swimsuit cover girl for Sports Illustrated. And um, she sits down. Bill Maher says to her, Kathy, why aren't you pro-choice? Kind of like me showing up in Potts' classroom. I mean, nice welcome. Here's what Kathy said. I'll paraphrase the essence of her argument. Bill, I used to be pro-choice, but then my husband went to medical school. And when he was in medical school, I began to read some of the books he was reading for his classes. And I read there that there's this principle in biology known as biogenesis. Living things reproduce after their own kind. Dogs produce dogs, cats produce cats, humans produce humans. And I reasoned from that that since the unborn come from human parents, they too are members of the human family. And we shouldn't harm them without justification. And I believe elective abortion unjustly harms a member of the human family. That's why I'm no longer pro-choice. Good answer? Grand slam home run. Did Kathy Ireland give evidence for her view? Yes. What did she cite? Medical textbooks. Did she cite a moral argument? Yes, she did. The unborn are members of the human family. I believe we should not harm members of the human family without justification. Is that a moral claim? Yes, it is. Therefore, I'm no longer pro-choice. Very solid argument. Listen to Bill Maher's reply. Well, gee, Kathy, that's just your view. Okay, you tell me, what did Bill Maher just do to Kathy Ireland's truth claim? Changed it from moral truth claim to what? Preference claim that he liked better. Did he refute her evidence? Not even close. Now, is it possible that Kathy Ireland is wrong? Yes, it's possible. But it's not going to work to just change the kind of claim she's making into one you like better. You have to do the hard work of actually refuting her claim. Did Bill Maher do that hard work? No. He changed her truth claim to something he liked better. Now, I'm going to stop here. Does everybody see that? Change the subject, change the rules. That's what's going on. And if you are not alert to that, you're going to get pushed into this mold that you're just an intolerant bigot. And the critic you're talking to will never do the hard work of refuting your argument. There's a name for this, and it's called relativism. Relativism. Relativism is the belief that right and wrong are either up to you, the individual, or up to your society. 
right and wrong are either up to you, the individual, or up to your society. There are no overarching standards that it's our job to get in line with. Right and wrong are up to you, the individual, or to your society. Let me give you some examples of relativism. You will see it every time you turn on your television, every time you read the press. Pardon an American example. I have a few. We have a journalist in the States known as Brit Hume. Brit Hume worked for years for ABC. He was their Washington correspondent, very respected journalist. Brit Hume, one Sunday, was on a Fox News channel. I had come home from work, I'm sorry, from church early. Um, I am one of those guys that I cannot wear a shirt until it's been washed 30, 40 times. It just feels itchy to me. And I can't figure it out. Uh, what I go through to find a t-shirt that doesn't itch is, is horrible. But I was wearing a new shirt, and it felt really bad. So I cut out of church early. Um, I left before the pastor was done because we were going to join some friends for ch uh, lunch. And I turned on the TV before going to lunch, and there was this Fox News panel. Brett Hume was on there and four, three other people. And here was the subject, Tiger Woods. You all know about Tiger Woods, right, the golfer? Tiger Woods has not exactly been the model of marital fidelity, has he? Subject that day was this. What does Tiger Woods need to do to reform himself? Fair enough. First panelist said, well, he's got to get in touch with his inner core values. If he can get in touch with his inner core values, I think that maybe he can turn things around. I'm sitting there listening going, no, his core values are the problem. We don't want to get in touch with those. We need new core values. The next panelist said, well, he needs therapy. He's got to get counseling. Get on the couch, dude. Then it came to Brit Hume. Here's what Brit Hume said. Tiger Woods will recover in his golf game. He will likely win another Masters. But he's not going to recover in his personal life if he doesn't reject Buddhism, which can't help him, and turn to the God of Christianity, who alone offers forgiveness and restoration. Outside of that, I don't see how he recovers. Whoa. <laughs> you know what's coming next, don't you? <laughs> Within seconds, the blogosphere and social media was aflame with critics saying, how dare Brit Hume claim his religion is more true than someone else's? How dare he claim that he's right and someone else is wrong? Nobody challenged him on the truth question. Nobody stepped up and said, um, wait a minute, Mr. Hume, Christian theology does not teach what you say it does. Christian theology does not teach Jesus is the only way. It teaches there are many ways. No, nobody did that. They were angry. He claimed to be right in the first place. You know what that's called? Relativism. And it's everywhere. Nine years ago, a rapper by the name of Nick Cannon. Some of you may know Nick Cannon. He's married to Mariah Carey. He is a rapper. I'm not a, a hip-hop guy. I'm classic rock and roll, so I'm not into to, to that stuff. But there was one song by Nick Cannon I did listen to, and some of you have heard it. It's called Can I Live? It's about his own mother, who when she was pregnant with Nick and ready to abort him at the last minute changed her mind. And thinking back on his mother being ready to abort him at age 17, when she was 17, and leaving that clinic before she went through with it, Nick wrote a song as if he were speaking to her from the womb. And here's the line that hacked a lot of people off. Nick says this, Mom, I hope you'll make the right decision and don't go through with the knife incision. Whoa. When he said, Mom, I hope you'll make the right decision, guess what he heard? Did people step up and challenge Nick on the truth that he articulated about the abortion procedure, yes or no? No. They were angry that he claimed to know what the right decision was. Who are you, Mr. Cannon, to say what the right decision is? Have you been 17 and pregnant? Do you know what that's like? If not, who are you to judge? Who are you to say what the right view is? By the way, when they said he shouldn't judge, what did they just do to him? <laughs> Judged him. So the whole thing was self-refuting, but never mind. 
Notice what was going on. They were angry that he claimed to be right. You know what the most popular bumper sticker in America today is? I don't know if it's popular up here. I have seen it up here. One word, coexist. Blue background, white lettering with the religious symbols of the major faith traditions in there. You know which one I'm talking about? Now, can I ask a question? Do we need a coexist bumper sticker in Canada? No. You know why? Because you don't get killed for believing the wrong thing up here, do you? You know where you need a coexist bumper sticker? Iran. <laughs> because there you will be killed for believing the wrong thing. So why is coexist so popular in the United States and Canada? I'll tell you why. It has nothing to do with tolerance in the classical sense. Here's the classical view of tolerance, which I fully just went through puberty. Uh, sorry. <laughs> fully. Uh, man, it's that Canadian coffee you people have been feeding me. I fully support the classical view of tolerance. Here's the classical view. I think your view is wrong, but I respect you as a person. You are free to make the best case you can. By the way, that is a biblical view of tolerance. All humans bear God's image. Therefore, we should respect them as persons, but we don't have to respect their ideas as being equally valid to our own. Here's the new definition of tolerance. Theologian D.A. Carson puts it well in his book, The Intolerance of Tolerance. The new tolerance is not tolerance of persons. It's idea tolerance. Don't you dare claim your idea is more true than someone else's, especially on matters of religion and ethics. You with me so far on the difference between those two ideas of tolerance? So what's the new tolerance when it comes to the coexist bumper sticker? Simply this. That bumper sticker is not telling you to tolerate people. It's telling you as Christians, don't you dare claim your own faith tradition is more true than someone else's because all faith traditions are equally true. Now, I've got news for you. You can be a complete atheist and refute that claim. Greg Kolkel is right. When you die, you either go to heaven, you go to hell, you go to purgatory, you get reincarnated, or you rot in the grave. But you're not going to do them all at the same time, are you? We know for a fact that they can't all be equally true. If Jesus is the Messiah, Christians are right, Jews are wrong. If he wasn't the Messiah, Jews are right, Christians are wrong. Now it's possible all these religions are equally false, but they can't be equally true. You know what the new definition of tolerance is? It's all equally true. That's what we labor against. So when Nick Cannon says, Mom, I hope you'll make the right decision, people got angry with him because he violated that rule of idea tolerance. I'll give you another example before we move forward. Maybe you have uh, seen this. New York Times editorial writer wrote a piece just after 9-11 entitled, The New War Against Terror. And this journalist, Thomas Friedman, wrote that the real war on terror is not against bin Laden. It's against any religious person who claims his view is exclusively true. Anybody who makes an exclusive truth claim is the real terrorist. Question, what kind of claim did Mr. Friedman just make? He's claiming every view but his own is what? False and dangerous. This is the new tolerance that we labor against. It's called relativism, and I want to give you some tools for dealing with it. Let me distinguish for you briefly the three types of, of relativism, actually four types you'll encounter in the culture. Here you go. First type of tolerance is what we call society does tolerance. Society does relativism or tolerance. We'll use the term tolerance. Society does relativism goes like this. Cultures disagree on what's right or wrong. I mean, just look around. Look around. 
How can you say abortion's wrong when another culture over here, the Chinese culture, says it's okay and indeed necessary? Because cultures disagree on what's right and what's wrong, who are you to judge? That's society does relativism. It's the belief that because cultures disagree, nobody's right. But we already dealt with this. This clearly doesn't follow. It doesn't follow that because people disagree, there are no right answers. They disagreed on a host of things that we now know we have clarity on. Slavery, whether the earth is flat or round, whether spousal abuse ought to be permitted. These are no longer issues that we debate, though we once did. We have clarity on them. Truth can be known despite disagreement. But there's another problem with society does relativism. And it's simply this. Cultures don't disagree as much as you might think. In fact, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, oftentimes the difference is over facts, not morals. Lewis puts it right. There are differences in cultures about whether you may have one wife or several. But no culture says you can grab any woman you want and force her to be your wife and do that to as many women as you wish. So there is an underlying moral principle, at least at a minimal level, that's in play here. Another example. How many of you have heard of Dennis Prager? Does that name ring a bell? Uh, Dennis Prager is easily the smartest guy on radio. Dennis is uh, heard nationally in the U.S. and in some markets here in Canada. I don't know which cities. I don't know if he's on in Edmonton. Um, he's not needed in Edmonton. You got Primo. But anyway, I'm just... She's a friend of mine, so I had to get that in. She owes me an Edmonton Oilers ticket uh, one of these days. Is she still on up here? She got canned? No, Leslie. I, I don't know if you knew this, but I used to go rounds with her on this issue quite a bit. It was fun. I loved her. She's spirited. She's fun. And uh, I'd go and sit in her studio, and we'd just have at it. And then during the break, she said, oh, I just love you. You're so affectionate. You know? <laughs> I always knew she was getting ready to unload something on me in the next segment. Anyway, Dennis Prager <coughs> holds this view. Humans have value simply because of the kind of thing they are. They have intrinsic value simply because they bear the image of God. Does that sound like a view we would agree with? Yes. However, he thinks first trimester abortion is morally permissible. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, now then, there's a worldview difference between Dennis and us, right? No. Here's the difference. It's a factual difference. Dennis agrees with us on the worldview principle that all humans have value because they bear the image of God. You know what Dennis's problem is? His Judaism informs him that the early fetus is not yet a human being. So where's our difference? Is it on morals or facts? Facts. Dennis is just flat wrong on the nature of the early fetus. That's a factual difference where he's mistaken, and I'm working with him on this, but it's not a moral difference. We share the same moral view, it's just a factual difference. Everybody clear on that distinction? So society, set, or society does relativism is often not in play. It's actually a factual difference. So when people say, well, nobody agrees on morals, wait a minute, they need to back up that claim. Second type of relativism you'll run into. Society says relativism. And by the way, these types of relativism, relativism that I'm going over here are found in Greg Kokel's book and Francis J. Beckwith's book, Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. Great book, you'll want to get that. Relativism, Feet Firmly Planted in Midair. Isn't that a great title, by the way? It just says it all. The second type of relativism that they discuss is society says relativism. And that goes like this. Right and wrong are determined by your society. Whatever your society determines is right and wrong, that's what you go with. That's the way it is. There's no objective standard. It's your society. All right. German society decides that killing Jews is okay. American, Canadian, and British society says no, it, no it's not. How then do we hold Jews, or excuse me, how then do we judge Germans at the Nuremberg trial as being evil as we did if society determines right and wrong. See the problem? You know what the German defense was at the Nuremberg trials? We acted according to our society's way of seeing it, paraphrase. That's right. And their defense was, who are you outsiders, you allies, to judge us 
when we acted according to what we believed was right. The court at Nuremberg didn't buy this. You know why? The court at Nuremberg said there's a law above the law that you're beholden to. And the court was right. If society determines right and wrong, there's no such thing as an immoral society. You can't judge German society or one that practices apartheid or abuse of women and children. You can't judge that society. Because who are you as an outsider to even think about doing that? Oh, one other thing. If society determines right and wrong, what are moral reformers by definition? Evil. That means Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King were all evil. Why? What did they do, all three of them? Challenge their society's moral codes. That means by definition they're evil. Society can't be judged good or bad. It can only be changed. Third type of relativism you'll encounter. This is what we call I say relativism. This is the person who looks at you. You lay out your case for the pro-life view. Hey, elective abortion is wrong because it unjustly takes the life of an innocent human being. And the person looks at you and says, who are you to impose your morals on me? That's I say relativism. Right and wrong are up to you, the individual. No overarching standard. Of course, if right and wrong are totally up to you as an individual, there's no such thing as an immoral individual is there. Jeffrey Dahmer, he liked to eat people. Mother Teresa, she liked to feed them. We can't really judge, can we? Because after all, it's reduced to the individual. That's known as I say relativism. All right, there's your broad out view of the problem. Now let's talk about how we respond. How do we respond as pro-lifers? The first thing we need to do, to do is recognize a few flaws. And here's the biggie. Relativism is self-refuting. Tell me what's wrong with the statements I'm about to make. Ready? My brother is an only child. <laughs> so you're going, where's that coffee cup? I know there's something wrong with that. I just need another sip. I cannot speak a word in English. You're in rare form as usual. Don't take anybody's advice on anything. Somebody going, oh, I like that one. Question authority. There is no truth. All right. Help me out. What's wrong with those statements? The minute you say them, they what? They implode on themselves, don't they? When someone says to you, you shouldn't force your view on me, what did they just do to you? Forced a moral rule on you that they expect you to what? Obey or comply with. Do relativists think they're right and moral objectivists like us are wrong? Yes. Do they think their view is right? Do they think everyone else ought to be relativists like them? Yes, that's why they write books, by the way. If there's no truth, why are you writing a book to tell us that? You see, these are self-refuting claims. I was, um, I'm a baseball fan, living most of my life in L.A. I'm an L.A. Dodgers fan. That's been painful for many years for the most part, but I remain a strong Dodgers fan. Several years ago, when my boys were... Uh, six and five respectively. We were going down to a Dodger game on a Friday night. I had a friend who was a Seventh-day Adventist and Seventh-day Adventists keep the Jewish Sabbath and uh, they're a Protestant denomination uh, but they believe that the seventh day is hallowed and ought to be kept the way the Jews kept it in, under the Mosaic Law. And this Seventh-day Adventist friend of mine had season tickets to the Dodgers and he wouldn't go on Friday nights or Saturdays because that would be a violation of the Sabbath rest so he'd give me the ticket, so I guess I could go break the Sabbath for him. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> one day, one Friday night, I'm driving down to Dodger Stadium, and at the time I had uh, God's curse to the automobile industry that I was driving, a 1983 Ford Taurus, because that's the car I had at the time. 
and uh, Satan invented that car. But anyway, we were, <laughs> we were driving down toward Dodger Stadium, and I had two bumper stickers on the rear that said, we can do better than abortion, and the other one said, some choices are wrong. Not in your face, just thought-provoking. And this white pickup truck, driven by a woman in her late 20s to early 30s, gets right up on my bumper. She's flashing her lights at me. She's not happy with the stickers. I know it. <laughs> she tailgates me for a while, finally pulls out to pass me. And as she goes by, she extends a certain part of her physical anatomy skyward to let me know what she thought about those stickers. Tyler, who was five, said something like, look, Daddy, she loves Jesus like us. We're, she's pointing to him. I said, no, she's not, son. Um, we'll uh, talk about this when you're 40. But um, she then cut in front of me. And when I read her bumper sticker, I was laughing hysterically. Her sticker said, celebrate diversity. In other words, be tolerant of everyone. And she saw no contradiction between her unwillingness to tolerate my view and her bumper sticker that said we ought to tolerate all views. This is the problem with relativism. The very person who says you must tolerate other views will not tolerate dissent. It's a self-defeating view. It's also an impossible worldview to live with. Mother Teresa, Adolf Hitler, well, they just had different preferences. Mother Teresa liked to help people. Hitler, well, he liked to kill them. Who are we to judge? But we do know better, don't we? We know there's a difference between starving a kid and feeding him. Hard to account for that difference on relativism. Third problem, you've never met a relativist who actually lives consistently with that worldview. <coughs> C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said, the very man who tells you there is no objective right and wrong will complain if you cut him off in line. What will he say? That's not fair. fair. And Lewis has a great comment. He said, where does this notion of fairness come from? In fact, Lewis says, for years I was an atheist because I couldn't reconcile God with all the unfairness I saw in the world. But then it finally, finally dawned on me, where did this notion of fairness come from? It makes no sense to complain about things being unfair unless there is a what? Standard you're measuring this by. And Lewis goes on to give the example of children quarreling. Ever seen kids fight? They're hardwired to fight. I mean, as soon as they can talk and they're, they're, you put the little, you know, two-year-olds in a room together, they're reaching over and Johnny's grabbing Missy's little pacifier, trying to stick it in his own mouth. And, She's yelling, trying to grab for it, but doesn't quite have the words to complain. What's going on there? Quarreling. What's the thing you hear when children are old enough to articulate language? That's not fair. There's something of a standard implied in that, isn't there? The very man who says he's a relativist goes back on it a moment later. Father Pavone, a Catholic priest, friend of mine, told a story he was in New York talking to a group of feminists, the leading ladies who are in charge of feminism in the U.S. And uh, as we were at dinner that night, he said, yeah, I just had a dialogue with him. Only these ladies didn't want a dialogue with him. They wanted to eat him for lunch. But they didn't know who they were picking a fight with. And um, he sat down in this circle in this room, in his Catholic cleric collar. And speaker after speaker lit into him, Father Pavone, who are you to force Catholic religion on women who disagree? Who are you to tell women what choices they should make? Who are you to take away their liberty to decide for themselves a just future? And just on and on. Finally, the lady next to him erred badly. She said, Father Pavone, I would never tell you what's right or wrong for you. Where do you come off telling me what's right or wrong for me? And Father Pavone, very politely, didn't say a word. Well, I guess it wasn't polite, but he just very nonchalantly reached down and snagged the lady's purse put it in the table in front of him, unzipped it, and began to yank stuff out of this purse. <laughs> she said, what are you doing? I just thought I'd go through your purse and see if there was something in here I might like. <laughs> she said, you can't do that. He had a two-word reply. Anybody know what it was? Why not? Why not? Because that would be wrong. Were you going to say wrong? 
That's your individual view of morality. It's not mine. Please don't impose it on me. He went back to <laughs> Now, don't do this. What'd you learn today, honey? Oh, how to steal purses and uh... But notice what Father Pavone did. He demonstrated that the very person who said there is no right and wrong went back on it a split second later when what? Their personal hot button issue was pushed, right? Okay, folks, here you go. Next time someone says to you, who are you to force your views on me? Do not get nasty. Do not get defensive. Very sweetly smile and say, why not? What's wrong with that? Any answer given will be an example of what? Them forcing a moral viewpoint on you. There is no single challenge to the pro-life view that's more devastating in terms of robbing pro-lifers of their confidence than the challenge of relativism. I also am convinced it's true of Christianity in general. A lot of Christians are afraid to speak confidently about what they believe because they don't want to be viewed as intolerant. And the reality is that's not a legitimate challenge. That's not a refutation of our view. It's changing the subject to something they like better. Don't let them get away with that. There is one other kind of relativism I probably ought to mention here because you'll get it occasionally at the academic level. Okay, it goes like this. Right and wrong may exist, but we can't know they exist because we're trapped behind our sense perceptions the way Kant would argue, or we're trapped behind language, the way philosophers like Wittgenstein and others might argue. The postmodernists in today's world, those who believe there is no such thing as objective truth, would argue we're largely trapped behind our individual language communities. And we literally, as one of these guys argued, construct reality by talking about it. That's how reality comes into being, by us talking about it. Their attitude is this, we can't know what's true or what's right because we're trapped behind our own perception. Now, based on what I've already taught you, can you see a problem with that view? What does it do? What's the problem with that view? Very wise man. On one hand, they're telling us we can't know truth, we can't know what's real, but then on the other hand, they're stepping up to tell us what? What's real? We can't know anything. You see the, the, the inherent flaw in this? This is how crazy it's become in our culture. This is why starting the debate with what is the unborn and getting that nailed down is crucial. Oh yeah, there'll be people who say, Everything's just a matter of perspective, including that. Is that true or just your perspective? You see, the thing literally self-defeats. And it's important that you not be held savagely imprisoned by a worldview that can't even stand up on its own legs. Relativism is not a refutation. When someone says to you, you shouldn't force your views on me, simply say, what's wrong with that or why not? And any answer they give will be an example of them doing the very thing they're accusing you of. You know what the only response of a, relative is? a relativist is? Complete silence. The minute they make a judgment, the game's up. The game's up. All right. I went over last time and didn't leave enough time for questions, and I have to end at 12.15. Is that correct, 12.15? 12.30. So guess what? I'm going to give a little more time here for questions in this session since I ate up all the question time in the last one. Uh, so we'll take some time now for some questions on relativism or material I covered in the first session that you didn't get a chance to ask my opinion on. I'll be glad to do that uh, right now. So who's up first? Yes, sir.
Yeah, the question is, we used to teach logic, we used to teach critical thinking, and we seem to not be doing that anymore. Isn't that part of the problem? Yeah, it's absolutely part of the problem. Here's the thing, though. There are intuitions people have that have to be there for them to even have a conversation, and you can still appeal to those intuitions. And the example I just gave you of the self-refuting nature of relativism is a way to do that. It's like the guy who says, well, I'm done with Western logic. I don't accept Western logic. I think we should be more Eastern in our thinking. Of course, what is he doing in saying that? Trying to advance what? An argument that he believes is logical to make his point. So this is something you can appeal to. Uh, I don't think the loss of critical thinking is gone. I think it's been damaged. And it's all, part of our job is when we teach pro-life apologetics, we're actually helping restore, I believe, some of the broken links. Not all, but but some. Good question. Uh, do you think that this idea of relativism, uh, relativism came from the devil himself? Do I think relativism came from the devil himself? If I believe as a Christian that the devil is the father of lies, and I believe that relativism is a lie, then I will definitely accept the premise that he has influenced this. But I don't want to say, and I want to be very careful here, I don't believe that every person who espouses relativism is satanically influenced directly like that, or that they are of the devil. What I do believe is false ideas and false philosophies take root in a culture that is fallen, and ours is fallen. But at the same time, truth can take root as well. We are fallen, we are flawed human beings, but we are not hopeless in the sense that truth can never triumph. Did, tr did truth triumph in destroying what Hitler attempted to do in World War II? It did. Costly, but it, it did triumph. Uh, in my nation, did it triumph on the issue of slavery? Yeah, it did. We, we got rid of it. Uh, and this is an important point. I'm going a little off subject to your question here. But here's an important point. Do not accept the view of inevitability that says, oh, our culture is inevitably sliding down the tubes and we're just never going to come back. Do not accept that defeatist mindset. People said the Berlin Wall would never come down. In fact, I was in a college symposium in 1984 and a professor of history stood up and said, I'm going to make a bold pronouncement here. I actually think the Berlin Wall is going to come down in 10 years. We laughed him off the stage. Turns out he was wrong. Came down in five. Now, these things can change. I'm of the view, this is arguable, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. Here's my view. I think our problem is we haven't even put an army in the field yet. That's the problem. We have not even begun to fight. So let me raise some questions to back that up. How many Christian universities, Catholic, Evangelical, in the United States, Canada, or Great Britain have a pro-life major in place with the purpose of training Christian students to take careers in full-time pro-life apologetics advocacy, how many of them are out there that have a designated major? None in the 70s. I'm looking to see if we have any now. Now, please hear me. I am not suggesting that there aren't good schools out there doing good work who are indirectly changing and training people. I went to Biola University. They have an MA program in apologetics. I have friends who went to Concordia in St. Louis, others in LA. They learned great things and were able to use that training to transition into apologetics work. Very valuable training. So I'm not asking the question of, is there value? I'm saying when it comes to the pro-life issue, do we have a major anywhere? I'm not aware of one. An interdisciplinary major, and by the way, I am not trying to put this bug in your uh, head uh, indirectly, uh, directly maybe, but not indirectly. Um, <laughs> I, I think we need it. And we'll ship all the American students up here to, to get it done, you know, if we have to. But this is the kind of thing that would be happening if we were really winning this fight at the level we need to be winning it. Um, so, 
I don't think it's inevitable that we lose. I think it's problematic that we're losing now because we haven't really begun to fight at the level we want to. Greg Cunningham has a great point. He says there are more, more people working full-time to kill babies than there are working full-time to save them. And that's because killing babies is very profitable while saving them is very costly. So costly that large numbers of people who say they oppose abortion do just enough to salve the conscience, but not enough to stop the killing. Yeah. Yep. Now that, that's a pretty heavy quote from Greg Cunningham. What would happen, I'm going to dream here a little bit, what would happen if we found a way to get hundreds of self-supporting pro-lifers in this fight who could work full time to change that? Who leads the pro-life movement in the United States. I won't speak for here because I think I know the lay of the land, but I, I may not know it as well. I obviously don't know it as well as you do, but I'll, I'll speak for my own country. You know who leads it in the US? Part-time moms, largely, trying to fit in pro-life work while they do what? Raise kids and do all the other stuff they got to do. Who's leading the pro-abortion movement? Professional paid elites in what fields? Medicine, law, education, politics. Who wins? Not us. Not us. If that's the model we will always fight under. What happens, though, when we get more full-time people working? I'll give you a little Canadian example here. 1999, I was speaking in... Toronto, January of 1999, at a symposium known as NCLN. Any students here? If you are, you need to be involved with NCLN. It's a Canadian network of pro-life students, and they invited me up for their conference in Toronto. And I got done teaching two days of pro-life apologetics training, and an 18-year-old girl came up to me, freshman. She said, I want to be your clone when I grow up. I thought, oh, how cute. You know, isn't this nice? Yes, yes, isn't that? Yeah. That little 18-year-old girl went back to her college, UBC, and turned that campus upside down during the time she was there. She put up a pro-life display. When pro-abortion student uh, pro students tore it down, she appealed to the Crown and took legal action against them. She raised the money to have the signs replaced. She formed a very energetic pro-life club on that campus. And then when she graduated, she came to a support raising training seminar that I taught in New York, where she and 30 others were trained to raise support for full-time pro-life work. And they've been active here in Canada since that time. Her name is Stephanie Gray. I don't know if that name rings a bell. Um, where would we be if we didn't have a Stephanie Gray in this fight? Jojo Ruba, that name ring a bell? He was one of those trained. These are sharp people. And what if we could get hundreds of those people trained to raise their own support the way groups like Campus Crusade, the Navigators, and others raise support as missionaries? And we just teach them how to raise the money they need to work full time being pro-life apologists. Would that over time make a difference? I think it would. I've gone way off your question. But you know, if you object, that's just your view. All right, um, <laughs> in the very back. It was a great question, by the way. What do you do with those who say, I'll concede your point, it's human, so what? Like David Boonin, who I mentioned. And uh, I will be taking aim at David Boonin in more detail in my session, but let me address this. First of all, 
people who say it's human and will kill them anyway, I often don't believe they, they believe their own rhetoric. A woman who says to me, my unborn fetus, we'll call it a fetus, my fetus is human, and I know that, but I have to have this abortion. I have to go through with this anyway. I don't believe her that she believes her unborn are human. She's not telling me the truth, and here's why I believe that I'm right. Would she use those same arguments that she's using for killing her fetus if we were talking about killing her two-year-old? Why is it only the fetus gets eliminated, not the two-year-old, for the reasons she cites? Well, maybe so. But see, it would never cross this woman's mind to kill her two-year-old because she can't feed the two-year-old. She only kills her fetus for that reason, who's not even eating yet. So why does she kill the fetus and not the two-year-old? Why is the fetus the only one she thinks of killing? It's not because she believes the fetus is human and valuable like her two-year-old. It's precisely because she believes it's not. And that is my contention. I think the pro-life movement has been sold a bill of goods on this. In that, people have told us from within our own movement, and you didn't do this, I'm talking about those who have given the argument you just articulated a moment ago. We've been told that the battle over the question, what is the unborn, is over. They already agree with us. No, they don't. Because if they did, they would behave differently toward their fetuses that would be more consistent in principle with how they would treat a two-year-old. And they don't. It's always the fetus that gets killed, right? So I don't believe them. I just don't believe them. Now, I think that, though, I still need to explain, then, why do people say this? And I think I have an answer for that. Journalist Christopher Caldwell, who's not pro-life, has written that in North America, the public wants to condemn abortion with its words, but make sure it's legal av legally available for their own personal necessity, unquote. And he argues that the reason people say that they know abortion is killing, but they want to have the option to do it legally, is they're freeloading off a cheap pro-choice culture. And what he means by that is this. The culture wants to be able to soothe its condemning conscience over abortion by condemning it, but not have that in any way limit their own personal options. So the way they cut that difference is to condemn abortion with words, but make sure it's always available. That's what I think is going on. Because it somehow seems noble to say, oh yeah, I, I know it's killing, you're right, but I, my own personal circumstance trumps everything else. By the way, what is that called? Relativism, right? That is relativism. All right, question related to that? Yes, but she would never, she does believe the need trumps her child, but she would never argue that way if we were talking about her two-year-old or her five-year-old. Well, no, but, but now you're putting her, I can see that now you're putting her in a situation where that child is born, the child is two-year-old, the child is caring for the child versus the condition before, where she is considering all the ramifications of her making the decision to have the child is irrelevant to the question of what kind of thing is that child. She does not believe it's human the way her two-year-old is because she would not ever, ever say kill the two-year-old but not the fetus. It's always the other way around. But she doesn't have a two-year-old. All she has is a child. But in principle, if she did have a two-year-old, she would never argue that way. Yeah. Okay, let's say she's talking to a friend, and that friend says, uh, I want to kill my two-year-old because I can't afford to feed him. Would she say, go ahead? No, so it is relevant. In principle, she knows that. So that's my point. She doesn't think of the fetus the way she thinks of the two-year-old. And if she did, if she truly were telling us the truth, that she believes it's human and valuable like the two-year-old, we wouldn't be hearing that rhetoric. That's my point. You can argue it, by the way, and, and um, uh, you, you can disagree. It's okay. You're wrong, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes.
Yeah, what about those who say it's the legal issue? It's legal to kill the fetus. It's not legal to kill the two-year-old. And the, the woman who says that is right. As, as you all know in Canada, there is no law on abortion. You have only your Morgenthaler decision, really, that is the default <laughs> position, and that goes back to 88. Your parliament could rule on abortion if it chose to, but unlike our Congress, which can't rule, yours could. Actually, you, you have a, I know you're not going to like hearing this, but you have fewer obstacles to ending abortion here in Canada at the legal level than we do in the states. Because your courts haven't foreclosed on the legislative branch, the parliamentary branch. It's just left it and said they can if they want, but they choose not to. So Morgan Toller remains. But here's the thing. You're right, you need to draw a distinction between what's legal and what's moral. Slavery was once legal in my country. It didn't make it right. Uh, spousal abuse was once legal in large parts of Western Europe. Didn't make it right. You've got to draw that distinction between the legal and the moral. And so with that client who comes to you and says, listen, um, I, I believe it's human, but I, I could kill it. I, I can kill it because it's legal. Change, change the law on them. Say this, OK. If, par if Parliament tomorrow rules that abortion is wrong, does that suddenly make your child wrong to kill? So see, may show the absurdity of reducing morality to the, the current legal status. Right. But I wouldn't shoot you on the way out, even though you disagree with me. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, look, I certainly don't dispute that it's a, a woman feels more connected to a child she sees than one she doesn't. I don't dispute that. What I'm saying is her fundamental worldview beliefs do not agree with us on the humanity of the unborn. That's what I'm saying. Of course her connection is greater to a child she sees. And you're absolutely right that ultrasound allows her to connect with that child. But here's the thing. It doesn't help her connect. It doesn't help all women connect. There are some who will choose abortion still. Guess what is more effective at reaching those women? The abortion pictures, which is why we need to, to show them. So when you ask, how do we help people connect with children they can't see versus one they, ones they can, then the abortion imagery is indispensable in that kind of environment to help them. Uh, so no argument for me that a woman connects more with children she can see than those she can't, but it doesn't follow from that that her fundamental belief about the child is in agreement with ours. For example, suppose a woman gives birth to a child but never sees it and it's left in a closet somewhere. And suppose her, she gives birth to twins. The other twin is born, she sees it. And suppose she doesn't know that she has this other child. She's been kept in the dark about it. And three months later, the child in the closet who's been cared for and kept but out of her knowledge, she's suddenly told, you, you, you have another child. Uh, she has had no connection with that child to that point. Does she immediately at that point able to grasp, hey, that's a living human being like this child is? I would say yes, she would recognize them both as human. Where with abortion, she would never then say, well, we can kill that one because I've never seen him yet, never connected with him. You see my point on that? So I think the connection issue has to be separate from the moral worldview issue. And I think her worldview is not with us on this issue. I'm open to hearing I'm wrong on that, by the way, but that's, that's my take. All right, I got, do I have time for a few more? OK. Anybody that hasn't asked one yet before I take repeat offend, I mean repeat uh, questions? <laughs> right there. How do you relate all this to, how do you use trot out the toddler on the, the doctor-assisted suicide euthanasia? Um, well, you, you trot out an old man. No, I'm kidding. Uh, 
you know, here's the thing. On, on doctor-assisted suicide, here's the, the thing we need to, the distinction we need to make. What is our pro-life argument, first of all? Is it that killing is always wrong? No. What's our argument? It is always wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being. Is doctor-assisted suicide intentionally killing an innocent human being? Yes. So the arguments relate to each other, don't they? So here's how I approach this. And I'm going to say something here. We have a little bit of an advantage over you in the states because we have this concept of, of natural inalienable rights that is not as clearly articulated here, although it's interesting, uh, charters on human rights borrow from that natural right uh, traditional lot. They just don't like to acknowledge it. But, but let me get to my point. The United States has a document called the Declaration of Independence. It has a key sentence in it that goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, uh, among which are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Now here's the thing. If a right is a fundamental right, inalienable right, you do not have the right as a subject to renege on it. You have it whether you choose to accept it or not. It's not up to you to accept it or reject it. You can't reject it. Our founders don't let you. American, those of us south down there. Um, the, our founders say you cannot renege on that. That's why they use that term, inalienable. Now, right to die movements fly in the face of the American Declaration of Independence, which is what I wish the American pro-life movement had argued from the beginning. Instead, when Terry Schiavo was dying, remember that woman in Florida? What was the pro-life argument? Oh, she could get better. Totally wrong answer. Did she have to get better before she could avoid being killed? No argument was she's a human being with a right to life even if she never gets better. Her right to life is what? Fundamental. You can't just wish it away. So when it comes to doctor-assisted suicide, my argument is that when we, we talk about doctors actively killing another human being, killing them uh, intentionally, that violates their fundamental natural right to life. And that can't be infringed upon. And that's why that's wrong. Now, our critics are fine to come along and say, well, we don't accept natural rights. We say you only have rights if the government gives you them, which is what they typically say. OK, fine. The same government that gives you a right to life, or for that matter, a right to an abortion, can do what? Take it away. That's why when pro-abortionists say, well, here's a great question. Someone says to you, well, I support a woman's right to choose. Where does that right to choose come from? Well, the government gave it to women in the Morgenthaler decision. All right, well, first of all, the government is not the court. But that aside, uh, it comes from, we'll say, Ottawa, Supreme Court. Fine. The same Canadian Supreme Court that recognized a right to an abort can do what? Unrecognize it. Now what? Where does this right to abortion come from? Well, women have it simply because, well, they have a fundamental right to life that transcends the government. Uh-oh. Where does that right come from? You starting to see where I'm going with this? Um, this is extra credit. So you're free to check out with what I'm about to say, OK? Just extra credit. Some of you are going, caffeine, I really need it. So here goes. And I'm even going to move around front here so it seems even more clear. <laughs> Professor Hadley Arcus has a great way of illustrating the absurdity of someone saying women have a right to choose. Well, of course, choose what? Well, they mean abortion. Make them define that, by the way. He says, you know, when they say a woman has a right to an abortion, always ask, where does that right come from? Well, it comes from the government. OK, so the same government that grants a right to an abortion can do what? Take it away. Now where does that right come from? And here's what the critic inevitably has to say. Oh, it's a natural right that the woman has simply in virtue of her humanity. And then Arcus says this, which leads us to this very curious conclusion. Think of, if you want to know what Hadley Arcus looks like, you know who Groucho Marx is? Looks just like Groucho Marx. Arcus says, leads to a very interesting conclusion. Unborn women in the womb do not have a right to life, but they do have a right to an abortion in virtue of their humanity. Do you see the craziness of what this leads to? 
Uh, that's where we are as a culture. Extra credit part is over. And uh, so does that answer help give you a little start? Uh, there are unique arguments to the whole debate over doctor-assisted suicide that you'll need to apply tactically, but the fundamental issue is the same. It's wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being because that innocent human being has a fundamental right to life that exceeds the government. That argument applies to the old as well as the young. That's not to say that doctors can't treat the pain in patients even in ways where death may be foreseen but not intended. For example, you're, you have can't, well, we won't say you, but say someone has cancer final stages. They no longer can eat. Food and hydration are no longer a help to them. It's actually hurting them. The doctor withholds those things in the final, final stages. Not with intent to kill, but with intent to make the patient as comfortable as possible while the cancer is killing them. Or the doctor may increase the dosages of morphine, not for the purpose of wanting to kill the patient or intending to kill the patient, but because he wants to make that patient as comfortable as possible, death can be foreseen, but it's not intended. So we also need to make that distinction. I'm going a little farther off than, was there a question over here? Yes, you're up. More of them than there are abortion clinics. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, and they have to go to Edmonton or Calgary. Yeah. And like, you can't be generalizing because it seems like we were seeing the wall all the time. Like, mm -hmm. they wanted to bring um, it up in, in um, what is it, Congress? But, um, now you're talking like, you, you, <laughs> you're talking like one of us now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we get more American information a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we signed petitions, we wrote letters, and, and it, it feels very discouraging yeah. when it comes to the parliament, like the yeah. laws and that. But I was so happy when we went there and, and that we heard that, you know, no doctor is going to red beer children brought to, yeah. you know, to will, will perform, and yet these, these clinics are, are growing. And what do you to say? There's so many new clients every day. I forget yeah. they Right. I don't know the statistics on that, but it's encouraging. You make a good point, and that is, look, you look at the uh, national level and you think, gosh, the Harper government doesn't even seem to support private member bills. Uh, Ken Epp introduced one a few years ago. Uh, other MPs have done this. At the provisional level, you think, gosh, you know, going way back past the time of, of uh, Ralph Klein, you, you know, the, for 40 years there's been no real movement on this issue. Um, and we're certainly not going to see it with the progressive conservatives in power. I, I don't uh, think we're going to see Allison anytime soon coming to our point of view on this. So isn't it likely that we feel kind of discouraged? And, and you make a good point, though. Pro-lifers should always work incrementally to limit the evil of abortion insofar as possible, given the political realities we're forced to labor under. So that may mean that though we can't get abortion defunded in Alberta, maybe they're at least right yet. I don't think we should ever give up on the fight. I'm just saying maybe you can't do it right now. Uh, but you know what? Can you work to support these pregnancy centers and see to it they get legal protections? That's a plus, and that does have an impact on lives saved. Uh, not at the huge national level that we want and keep working for, but it's a way to keep going. Uh, what I don't support is, are those who say, well, we will never win at the national level, and we have a guy like that in the U.S. who I respect, I love him, he's a great guy, but he's given up on the national front. He says all we can do is work locally to chip away. No, we do both and. We don't give up on one. We just, uh, who would have thought, I mean, let's just take Canadian politics for a moment. Who would have thought after what, what, what happened with Stockwell Day 
in 2002 that you would see uh, an alliance party come and you'd act, now forget whether Harper is with us on this issue, I'm, I'm just, bear with me on this. Who would have ever thought you would have even seen a government that would win an outright majority a few years ago with the term conservative after it? The label was considered so badly damaged that it would never come back. Uh, and yet here it is. So that, I'm not, again, affirming that we applaud everything and especially their unwillingness to take on some of these issues like abortion. I wish they would. Um, yeah. Uh, Henny, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Not ever recognize euthanasia. Were these private member bills? Will the government pick them up? Oh, at the convention. Okay. Oh, at the conservative party convention. Gotcha. I'm sorry. Hard of hearing. All right. Listen, I'm out of time. I have to let you go eat lunch, believe it or not. So, uh, again, I have a few books left. The three-pack, uh, Stand for Life, Case for Life, and DVD. There might be three or four of these left, uh, including this one. And we'll see you after lunch.